We're going to be in Proverbs chapter 15. We're going to be finishing the chapter this morning. So if you have your Bibles, you can turn there. Right now, Proverbs 15, we'll be picking up from verse 15. So 15, 15. And um, another, Megan said, you know, a lot of special things. It's a special Sunday, this Sunday, because of communion. Also, we're in the halfway point in the book of Proverbs. We're, we're halfway there, folks. There, there's no turning back now. There's only one way forward. We got to get all the way through. So uh, some of you guys thought we couldn't do it, but we did it. I thought I would lose my mind. And that's true. I am. Uh, Proverbs 15 is, is, is um, a very irritating passage, uh, like every other passage in the book of Proverbs, because it is, it is so rich. It is so widespread. I don't mind passages that go deep, but passages that are so wide, it's, it's like having five kids and no one wants to listen to you and you're trying to wrangle all of them together in the same room and Ever try to get a family picture when you have too many kids around? It's terrible, right? And this Proverbs chapter 15 is kind of like that, where it's like, okay, how do we get all these thoughts together? But God's going to give us the grace to get through, and I believe we're going to learn. Um, in our world today, we're influenced with various different inputs into our lives. And every single chair seated over here and those watching online, you've come here because of certain influences in your life. And we don't have to have the same influences. But one thing that's common is we are all influenced. Okay? Now, some of you I've gotten to know a little bit, which is great. Uh, some of us, we've been friends since, you know, even before we planted the church. And then I have my mother who's sitting over here who has known me since I was born. And I can tell you that when I look at her life, I can see so many influences she looks at me and she sees a lot of the influence in my life. Now, what happens is, as we're influenced, these influences begin to shape your worldview, okay? The way you view the world. What's a worldview? It's the way you view the world. Now, although Megan said this very beautifully, there's one thing that you and I have in common, which is the blood of Jesus that saves us. There are too many things that divide us. There are so many things that divide us, all right? Because of what's influenced us. But there's one thing that's common, that is the beautiful cross on which Jesus died. And at the, at the foot of the cross, everybody is equal. Amen, church? Yeah. Good. Now, that's beautiful. But this salvation that's brought to you, it has to show in your life, okay? And it has to show even beyond your influences. Now, many times we come from a background of either abuse, trauma, children of divorced parents. Some of you, you've grown up in foster care. Um, some of us, we've grown up just in the, you know, shadow of grief your whole life. Some of us, we've grown up with trauma that you didn't face, but your parents faced it. And so you've grown up with this, this sense of fear, although if you would talk to a counselor, they'd be like, your life looks great. But your parents screamed, ouch, when they were children, and so you flinch at the sign or at the symptoms of whatever the pain that they faced. Trauma is passed on very easily. We are all influenced by something or the other. You cannot escape it. And those influences change the way you look at the world. Please track with me this morning because I know that this message, for some of you, it's going to be life-changing. And for some of you, this is going to be absolutely worthless. And I feel sorry for you if this message is worthless because at some point, you're going to come face-to-face -face with the reality of your influences and you have to confront it. What happens for many of us is when we are face face to face with what influences us, we give in to the influence instead of overcoming it. So we say, well, I have an addictive personality. And so I'm influenced by this lifestyle and we succumb to it. We give in to it. We say that, well, my, my dad divorced my mom and that's the only example I have. So my life is going to go down the drain just like it did with my parents. 
I grew up without a dad, so I do not know how to be a dad, so I'm going to be a terrible dad. When you're face to face with what's influenced you, you have a decision to make. Are you going to overcome it? Or are you going to succumb under it? You see, your influences are so vitally important. The title for this morning's message is Divine Perspective. Divine Perspective. We're going to understand God's view for your life. Many of you, you'll pay money for someone to coach your life. You don't need to go there. This message is all you need, man. I'm telling you, marriage, ministry, business, work, entrepreneur, president of America, he needs to listen to this message. Because divine perspective. We're not going to get the perspective of our influence. We're not going to get the perspective of the world. We're not going to get the perspective from the guy that runs the Ford Motor Company. We're not going to get the perspective of the CEO of Home Depot. Too many times we listen to the perspective of these great leaders. But what we really need is divine perspective. Divine perspective. You see, in you, Every single one of you, I don't care how old you are, what you've done, what your experience is, what your educational background is, how much money you have. Every single one of you, you are hungry for the divine. Every single one of us. You will get in your car, you will drive to a different state if you heard about revival happening down over there. Because we're hungry for the divine. And you cannot settle for the perspective of man. You've got to get down to, okay, what does the word of God say? Are you ready for what God's word says? Yeah. Then on your feet, we're going to read the word of God. And if you're new visiting over here, we stand for the reading of God's word because we honor the word of God. Like I just said, man's perspective will fall short. It stinks. Man's perspective is formula driven. It's opinionated, but God's word is divine. Truth is always going to be relevant. And this morning, we're going to be reading a few verses, little more than 15 verses. And it is going to confuse you as I read this. It is going to make you feel like, man, it is, it's a little too much. It's going to be like a shotgun shell. It's going everywhere. But I believe in the Holy Spirit. And I hope you do too. And I believe that we cannot find understanding and meaning devoid of the Holy Ghost. We need to invite the Holy Spirit to come in to bring meaning into this. And so as we read this, I want you to participate and ask the Holy Spirit to begin to stir in you a desire to want to grasp the meaning of God's Word, okay? So let's read the Word of God. Proverbs chapter 15, picking up from verse 15. All the days of the afflicted are evil, but the cheerful of heart has a continual feast. Better is a little with the fear of the Lord than great treasure and trouble with it. Better is a dinner of herbs where herbs is the way I say it. Herbs is the American way of saying it. That sounds very Jamaican herb. Sorry, I'm getting carried away. <laughs> Better is a little with the fear of the Lord than great treasure and trouble with it. Better is a dinner of herbs where love is than a fattened ox and hatred with it. A hot-tempered man stirs up strife, but he who is slow to anger quiets contention. The way of a sluggard is like a hedge of thorns, but the path of the upright is a level highway. A wise son makes a glad father, but a foolish man despises his mother. Folly is a joy to him who lacks sense, but a man of understanding walks straight ahead. Without counsel, plans fail, but with many advisors, they succeed. To make an apt answer is a joy to a man, and a word in season, how good it is. The path of life leads upwards for the prudent, that he may turn away from Sheol beneath. The Lord tears down the house of the proud, but maintains the widow's boundaries. The thoughts of the wicked are an abomination to the Lord, but gracious words are pure. Whoever is greedy for unjust gain troubles his own household, but he who hates bribes will live. The heart of the righteous ponders how to answer, but the mouth of the wicked pours out evil things. The Lord is far from the wicked, but he hears the prayers of the righteous. The light of the eyes rejoices the heart and good news refreshes the bones. The ear that listens to life-giving reproof will dwell among the wise. Whoever ignores instruction despises himself, but he who listens to reproof gains intelligence. The fear of the Lord is instruction in wisdom, and humility 
comes before honor. And that is chapter 15, the second part of it that we're going to be unpacking this morning. Here's going to be the basic outline for the few verses that we read. We're going to be talking about the power of perspective. We'll talk about the mystery of perspective and then the potential that perspective unlocks. Standing here in the presence of God are people created by a God who has potential in and of himself. He doesn't need anyone to give him potential, but he distributes potential to all his creation. And every single one of you has potential. But a cancer to potential is worldly perspectives. And so we're going to combat the worldly perspectives that quite possibly you're walking in, that's keeping your potential in checkmate. And we're going to look at divine perspectives. And we're going to challenge ourselves. We're going to see the power of perspective, the mystery of perspective, and the potential of perspective. Let's pray and we'll get to work. Father, this morning, I pray that you will change us from the inside out. Transform us, O Lord. Get us to a place where we're uncomfortable. Yeah, uncomfortable with the lies that we believed. Uncomfortable with our mindset that we have just grown accustomed to. Give us a holy dissatisfaction, Lord, this morning. And help us to press into the potential that you have created us with. As we fix our eyes on you, Jesus, please let your word now come alive. Speak to your church, O Lord. This is the living church. Let it be alive this morning. Show us the power that's there in perspective. Excite us with the mystery of perspective. And then to walk in the potential that comes from divine perspective. Have your way, my King, in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. I like it that the front row has Bibles and notes. That's beautiful. Greg, I'm looking at you, bro. <laughs> He's got his Bible. <laughs> I love it. Good, good, good. I see Bibles even in the last row, back row too. Very good. I like notes. Notes are good because... Um, too many times we write notes and then we leave it in the Bible and then your Bible gets really big. But notes are good because during the week, go through it and let God continue to speak to you. Uh, what you get on Sunday morning is going to be like a, you know, a big, 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 huge feast. And then during the week, you want to keep feasting on it and ask God continue to speak to you. Number one, write this down, please. The power of perspective. The power of of perspective. A um, few years ago when I was studying, and I think I preached a, a message on this from the book of John when we were going through it on perspective, and it kind of blew my mind when I realized that perspective is more powerful than facts. Perspective is more powerful than what is factually true. You see, you can be blessed in this country. You can be blessed with food, with a home to stay in, with a car to get you to work and back. However, if your perspective is that you're a victim, you're going to live the rest of your life like a victim. You can have the freedoms that majority of people in the world don't have. You can have access to help you can have access to information. You can have every single thing that, you know, that you, that you kind of look down on that is somebody's dream come true. And for the rest of your life, you live like a victim because your perspective is so tainted. I remember when we had a band in India and uh, there was this Korean girl who was managing our band for a bit and uh, we'll never forget what she said because we were so irritated that we you know, wanted to get a, a bigger deal and we wanted to go do more stuff. And we were having dinner together and she said, I just want you guys to know that what you guys are doing is somebody's dream come true. Like you're living somebody's dream. And I oftentimes think about it. How many times our perspective will keep you in a prison of self-loathing, you know, woe is me kind of an attitude. 
and you don't count your blessings. Perspective is more powerful than facts. In the same way, you can be a very talented individual. And I see many people like this, extremely talented, a lot of skills, but your perspective might be, I want to be an overnight success. So although you're talented and although you have, you know, skills, you don't hone it, you don't work on it because your perspective is, if it doesn't come easy, I'm not going to do it. And so you live like a loser for the rest of your life. You procrastinate because you feel like, ah, I don't need to get to it now. And one day you're old and you're retired and you've really not done anything with your life. The power of perspective. Perspective either will push you towards the potential, which is where we're going to end this message with, or it'll keep you as a victim for the rest of your life. See what God's word says about this, okay? Proverbs chapter 15, verse 15. All the days of the afflicted are evil, but the cheerful of heart has a continual feast. All the days of the afflicted. Now, last week, if you were here, we spoke about the poor and how the book of Proverbs in chapter 14 and 15 defines the poor. I said the poor are the people that you despise. Poor are the people that you look down on, that you hate. So it can be a rich man who has a tower with his name on it in gold, but in your estimation, that man could be poor because you despise him, you hate him, you can't stand him. And the Bible says, don't hate the poor, right? Because God says that's sin. But over here, chapter 15 is flipping the script and it says, all the days of the afflicted, another good word for that is for the poor. The word over there in Hebrew really is ani, which means poor. All the days of the poor, of the afflicted are evil, but the cheerful of heart has a continual feast. The, the, the contrast is not between the poor and the feasting, the contrast is between perspective and the way you look at your life. The cheerful of heart are happy. Now, this last week when I um, was looking at some of our comments online, there was one person who commented on one of our videos on, on YouTube who said, uh, this bro is living in a movie, talking about me. This bro is living in a movie when I said, sometimes the poor are way more satisfied in life than the rich. And I said, the rich commit suicide and kill themselves. The poor man, he looks mad. He's laughing to himself and he has friends. I mean, even the stray dogs are his friends. And, and when I saw that comment, you know, sometimes I just wish I could take a whole group of people to India. And these are not Christians, by the way. These aren't blood-bought, born-again believers, but their worldview, their perspective has taught them not to hold on to worldly things, to find joy and happiness. They know that money comes and money goes, but somehow in the Western world, we feel like success is 401ks. Retirement at 60 years old or 50 years old, buy a yacht and buy a house and, and then what? And then live depressed. I've spoken to some people who are one foot in the grave and who doubt their salvation, but they've been in church all their life. Why? Because sadly, the, even the church, man, disgusting. Even the church, the reason why I'm purposefully picking the series name Successful Living is because I want to confront this myth and this lie. You might have money, but it doesn't mean God is in it. You might be broke, but doesn't mean that God is not in it. What really matters is, are you seeing God's plans in your life? Are you seeing God's hand in your life? Because if you're living as a victim, it means you are comparing. And I've told you this before, life is not meant to be a comparison, but a divine mystery to be enjoyed. And the highs and the lows. When you're young, you're going to have energy. When you're old, you're not. But if God is in it, but if God is in it, you will have, and I promise you, you will have a cheerful heart. There will be sorrows. There will be nights where you weep in pain. But the Word of God says, though the sorrow may last for a night, His joy will come in the morning. I want to ask you, what are you telling yourself to keep you imprisoned this morning? What do you keep telling yourself? Now, it might not be the victim mentality because... I have no food, I have no dad, or I'm old, or I'm weak. 
but it could be I'm too stupid. I'm too sinful. God doesn't love me. It could be I'm unable to be faithful in my covenant with God. And so your perspective then is not based on the grace of God, the forgiveness of God. Your perspective is based on your righteousness, your holiness. And the Bible says that's cow dung. It stinks. Where is your perspective coming from this morning? If it's not divine, if it's not coming from God, ladies and gentlemen, my brother and sister in Christ, you are imprisoning yourself. And you will be a victim, not a person who has victory. Verse 16, better is a little with the fear of the Lord than great treasure and trouble with it. Now, this, this idea of perspective is going to keep building, okay? It's going to keep on reverberating. Better is a little with the fear of the Lord. We've been talking about the fear of the Lord quite a bit. And I don't know if you're taking this seriously or not, church. But this morning, I want you to take this seriously. The definition of the fear of the Lord. I've heard many people talk about the fear of the Lord. I've had people try to talk to me like, you need to have the fear of the Lord. Like, ooh, you know, he'll smite you, the mighty smiter. Reverence is good, but the fear of the Lord is this. In fact, I think we have a slide. The fear of the Lord is you living according to what God has given you. What's the fear of the Lord? Living according to what God has given you. What does that mean? We saw that verse. Better is a little with the fear of the Lord. You see, you're not being a victim now. You're not comparing your life based on that person has this, this person has this, that person's church is bigger, my church is small, this pastor earns this much, I only earn so much. Hey, 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 hey. Walk in the fear of the Lord. What is that? Walk according to what God's given you. That's it. Because you know what happens when you walk according to God's given you? You will treat it with such awe and reverence. Be like, wow, God gave me a thousand bucks. My rent is 1200 Praise the Lord. Let me give the tithe to the Lord and trust Him for the rest. You know, this should frustrate you. It frustrates me. Why aren't Christians as powerful as the Bible says that we can be? Because we don't have the fear of the Lord, man. We have the fear of man. We have the fear of money. We have the fear of investments. We have the fear of health. We have the fear of whatever it is. Fear of uh, elections. Fear of the country going to dogs. Oh, but we got to have fear of the Lord. What's fear of the Lord? It's walking in what God has given you. That's it. God's given you grace, extend grace. God's given you faith, walk in faith. Peter writes about this in his episodes. He says, let each man walk according to what God has given him. That is the fear of the Lord. Because when you're walking that way, trust me, the way you walk changes. God, you're giving me children. Help me to love them even though I want to get angry at them. That's walking the fear of the Lord. God, you're giving me a church to care for. I'm tired, I'm weary, but I trust you'll give me your word. And when God gives me the word, walk in the fear of the Lord. Walk in according to what he's given you. Nothing more, nothing less. And what happens when you're walking in the fear of the Lord? Your perspective begins to change because then you start seeing that great treasure means nothing because great treasure comes trouble with it. How does a person get great treasure? Well, you got to work really hard for it and you're working in your flesh. You're working according to what I can do, not according to what God wants to do. Job had to come to this realization. Some of you, you're suffering. Please be encouraged. Job had to come to this lesson that he had to learn. God destroys everything in his life. Every single thing. And he's sitting down. His children are dead. His business is gone. And he's got sores all over his body and he breaks a piece of pottery and he's itching himself. He's scratching, trying to relieve himself of the pain. And this is what he says, Job chapter 1 verse 21. And he said, naked I came from my mother's womb and naked shall I return. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. Read that last line with me with a loud voice. Blessed be the name of the Lord. That is walking and living in the fear of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. I know there's breakthrough in the pews right now because although you are struggling, you're suffering, you're alone, your whole life is falling apart. Learn to say, blessed be the name of the Lord. He gave, he takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Learn to jump and shout for joy. No longer receive the, 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 the perspective of the world, but hold fast to say, Lord, I hold on to your truth. 
Blessed be the name of the Lord. Let it come, let it go. I'm not going to strive in my flesh to get what the flesh wants. I'm going to trust the Lord. I'm going to keep walking in the trust of the Lord. Well, we'll look at Job's wife in just a little bit. But folks, this is the power of perspective. Number one, I told you the power of perspective. This is the power of perspective. Suffering cannot break you. <laughs> I love this man. I mean, if I didn't grow up Baptist, I'll be dancing all over the stage. <laughs> the power of perspective is no matter what's thrown your way, you will not be broken. You will, from the depths of your soul, you'll be able to say, blessed be the name of the Lord. Oh, Satan and all his forces can come against you. Blessed be the name of the Lord. That is the fear of the Lord. That is it. I mean, we could go home now, man, and that should change and transform your life. That will transform your generations if you raise your children in the fear of the Lord. Praise the Lord, but there's more. There's more. Verse 17, Proverbs chapter 15. Better is a dinner of her herbs where love is than a fattened ox and hatred with it. Once again, the comparison is not about love and hate in this verse, okay? Many times people use it and say, well, better is a dinner of herbs with love in it. Well, it's true, it's true, yes, yeah, right. But the comparison is between those who forfeit the so-called simple, but the love around the table, because you're so busy chasing the Wagyu steak. I know some of you are guilty of this. You're sitting at the table and your wife prepared a good meal for you, but you are scrolling online instead of enjoying the love around the table because your perspective is trying to reach something out there, a ghost out there that you will never reach. You know, worldly satisfaction never ends. It's like drinking salt water hoping to satisfy your thirst. It never ends. It'll drain you dry. Better is a dinner of salads, even if it has no croutons in it. I love croutons. <laughs> then Wagyu steak. But those who chase after the bigger, better, are those who have a worldly perspective and they forfeit what seems so simple. And again, I've spoken to people who envy the simpleness of simple people's lives because all the money in the world, all the leadership in the world, all the affluence and influence in the world didn't put someone that they can share love with. Job's wife, Job chapter 2, verse 9, then his wife said to him, do you still hold fast to your integrity? Pause real quick. Do you still hold fast to your integrity? We're talking about perspective. We're talking about perspective. You could see Job's wife's perspective over here. The correlation between integrity and perspective is pretty fascinating. Here's a person who lacks integrity and so they are inconsistent. Listen to me very carefully. People who are inconsistent are people who follow a worldly perspective. Today they are one thing, the next day they are something else. Those of you who want to strive and shoot up to stardom, you need to know that in the world, people will applaud you one day, the next day they scream, crucify. They are inconsistent. Those are people who lack integrity. People who lack integrity are people who are not ethical, as we're going to see in this very same chapter. People who lack integrity, they don't trust God, they will trust men, they will trust people, and they will trust their own wisdom. People who lack integrity, they will keep on shifting their focus. Maybe I just defined some of you. You're like, oh, pastor, that actually is me. I'm inconsistent. I'm not very ethical in what I do. I don't trust God. I trust myself. I really don't pray about things. And my focus keeps shifting. Well, you kind of sound like Job's wife then. And truth be told, almost every single one of us in certain areas, we are like this. Okay, I'm like this in many areas. But look at this. His wife tells him, curse God and die. Job, what are you doing holding on to your divine perspective? 
It's time for you to switch it up. It's time for you to give up. I know that many of you have family members like this. Life got hard and they left God. They said, well, I came to Jesus and life only got hard. Why should I keep going to church? Why should I keep reading the Bible? I've, I've spoken to many people like this. Curse God and die. They don't have integrity. Why? Because their perspective has been tainted by the world. But look at Job's answer. But he said to her, you speak as one of the foolish women, foolish women would speak. Shall we receive good from God and shall we not receive evil? And in all of this, Job did not sin with his lips. I, I love that Job, even in this is so patient. Look at him. He says, you speak as one of those foolish women. He doesn't say you speak like a foolish woman. Hey, you sound like a foolish woman now. He doesn't say you're a foolish woman. It's beautiful, this man's perspective. And even in this, even in his suffering, he's calling her to understand the power in perspective and says, don't be an idiot now. Don't be foolish now. Should we only receive good from God and should we not receive evil? And in all of this, Job did not sin with his lips. Job realized that God is just and his perspective on life was a reflection of who he saw God to be. Okay, so perspective is vital. I hope you're getting it. Perspective is powerful. Without it, without divine perspective, you will live as a victim because you begin to compare. You'll work really hard, but the only thing you get in the end is trouble. And sadly, like Job's wife, you'll have a heart of sorrow, not being able to claim victory even in times of suffering. And maybe this is your definition of life right now. I'm suffering, but I'm unable to claim victory. I'm sorrowful, but I'm unable to be victorious. Well, I'm glad you're here this morning because the second question you need to ask yourself is then how do I change my perspective, right? Okay, so if I see myself as someone who's struggling and giving under the pressure of feeling like a victim, feeling attacked, feeling defeated, no need to raise your hands, but every other person in this church, I believe, and I know, in areas of your life, you feel defeated. And there's a fair chance that we feel defeated because of perspective. How can I change my perspective? Well, let's, let's move on to number two and we'll see how God's word begins to give us answers to this question. How can I change my perspective? The mystery of perspective. The mystery of perspective. Now, um, the book of Proverbs, um, by the way, side note, I'm, I'm really, really impressed with you, church, really. Um, I'm hearing testimonies come from those of you whose lives, situations have been transformed by the series. Um, God's giving you divine insight and it, it really blows my mind that God's able to take this foolish man with such words of wisdom and then bring such transformation in your life. So I want you to make a commitment this week, okay, where we talk about the mystery of perspective. I want you to make a commitment with me this week. This message as it changes your life, I want you to email me. The email address is on the bulletin. Because when we're going to unpack, now we spoke about the power, which we know that if your perspective is not right, you're going to live as a victim the rest of your life in failure. But now we're going to ask the question, how can I change my perspective? And as we begin to unpack this, I believe that you're going to see divine mysteries open up right before you that's been in front of your eyes the whole time, but you've not had the eyes to see it. And I want to hear from you. Okay? And if I don't get an email, I'm not coming back next Sunday to church, all right? <laughs> like make up a story quick. No, I'm kidding. You see, when we talk about the mystery of perspective, you need to understand that whatever you look at, whatever you look at, you become. Now, you're like, Pastor, I'm looking at you, but I'm not getting any browner. <laughs> It's not what I'm talking about. It's not what I'm talking about. It would be great if it was that way, right? Yeah. I'll just keep looking at great six-pack abs and I keep eating donuts and be like, I'm becoming that. That's not what I'm talking about. You see, you and I, were created with this desire to grow and to learn. I mean, I want you to think about your eyes right now. Think about your eyes how much they absorb, how much they take in, how much they learn. It's beautiful. Man cannot recreate this with computers. Man cannot recreate this with AI. You and I are so beautifully made, man. We are so hungry 
to grow, to learn, to absorb. And how important is it then for us to learn and absorb the things that will benefit us and not the things that kill us? So I said, what you look at, you become, right? Now let's take it a step further, okay? What you look at, you begin to imitate. I used to really irritate my wife when we were newly married because uh, she used to work with this colleague of hers and she would come back and she had certain mannerisms and words that she picked up from a colleague. She'll fight and say till this day, nope, that was just me. You're just making things up in your head. <laughs> I don't, it's fine, it's okay. I mean, it happens, right? And now my son, he's 13 years old and I'm like, oh my goodness, he is starting to pick up from other kids, mannerisms and words. And, and, and that's something that really, you know, irritates me. But then I see the same thing in me too. Why is that? Now, I want you to get this. What you look at, you become more of. And then you begin to imitate what you see. So you don't want to be looking at the perspective of the world. You want to start looking more at God who made you because he's the one who can make you more like who he's created you to be. Whatever it is that shapes your perspective has control over you because whatever you're looking at is where you're going to take in. You're going to start receiving insight, input, and you're going to keep growing in that. Now, this is what worldviews are shaped from, okay? So as a child, you start imitating your parents, which is uh, very humbling because you look at your children, you're like, oh my goodness, they're just like me, right? Don't do that to your sibling. Don't say that, you know? <laughs> be slow to anger, little boy. <laughs> Don't be like your dad, but no. Your ch children begin to imitate their parents and then they start imitating their teachers and their classmates. And then they're influenced by either religion or society or the city they grew up in. And then they're influenced by the family that they're married off into. And that's the mystery of perspective is it has such a divine hold on you. Proverbs chapter 15, verse 18 says, A hot-tempered man stirs up strife, but he who is slow to anger quiets contention. What we're going to be looking at is three areas where you can begin to grow and shape your perspective, okay? Three areas, and here's the first one from verse 18. A hot-tempered man stirs up strife, but he who is slow to anger quiets contention. Okay, you ready for a perspective shift? Good, there we go. The lights are ready. <laughs> Number one, I want you to know, if you want to shape your perspective, be loving enough to get angry. Be loving enough to get angry. And I'll explain this in just a second. I told you that whatever you look at, you become. And whatever you become is an imitation of what it is you're looking at. Okay? And uh, this seems kind of counterproductive to what we've been talking about for the past few weeks on anger. And some of you, again, God's been working in you. God's been healing you. God's been giving you a breakthrough in this area. And how can this man say perspective is shaped when you are loving enough to be angry? Okay, look at that verse in 18. A hot-tempered man stirs up strife. We don't want to be hot-tempered. Look at the second part of it. It says, but he who is slow to anger quiets contention. God does not want you to have fired up, fueled anger in a drop of a hat. Neither does God want you to never be angry. You know why? Because either of those extremes shows that your perspective is shaped either by a world that fights for itself or the world that has medicated you to a point, whether it's through news and media and religion, where you really don't care anymore. I'm telling you, some of you, you're so prideful that you never get angry, and I'm telling you, that's a sin. There are times you have to be angry. But don't forget, the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. So our anger then has to be slow anger. 
I've lost some of you. So let's take it back to scripture. Exodus chapter 34, Moses, he's pleading with God. He says, show me. I want to see you. God, I want to see you. And God tells Moses, bro, if I reveal myself to you, you'll be like fried chicken. You'll burn up, you'll die. <laughs> That's the way I read it. Okay. So God says, you know what? This is what I'll do. Okay. I will pass by and I will cover you, but I will let you see my afterglow. And this is how God describes himself. Check this out. Exodus chapter 34, verse 6. The Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger. Wait a minute. God is defining himself as a person who is merciful, gracious, and slow to anger. I mean, this is God saying, Moses, you want to see me? Fine, here, I'll reveal myself to you by showing you my identity, my nature, my character. And he says, I'm a God who's merciful, who's gracious and slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. I want you to know that God is able to say that he's slow to anger because he's a God of love. Please track with me now. I know this message is wide, but I want you to get this. If you never get angry, that means you have no love. What is anger? Anger is you defending something that you love very deeply because it seems like it's a threat coming against it. Okay. Believers, if you want to shape your perspective according to the divine understanding of God, there are things that should make you angry. Now, don't go get angry with people who vote differently from you. <laughs> get angry with your own sin. Get angry with the things that stop you from being victorious and keeping you in a victim mentality. Get angry with the things that hold you back from the blessings of God. Get angry with the things that keep lying to you, saying that you have no purpose, that you have no potential, that you bloated. You have got to learn to get angry. I mean, don't forget Jesus got angry when he went and cleaned out the temple. And then the Bible says that this body is a temple of the living God. Get angry at your sin. And I know, I know, I know, I know, I know. We say, well, you know, love the sinner and hate the sin. And I've told you this before. How about you hate your own dang sin? I said, dang. Don't get mad at me. You want to shape your perspective for it to be divine? Hey, love the righteousness of God. Love what God loves enough for you to get angry at everything that opposes who he is in your life. Why? Because the mystery perspective is you become more like the person you're looking at. And God, when he made you, he made you in his image. And if God is slow to anger, man, then we also have got to show the same character and attributes of God in our own life. Right? Good. So... How can we have a correct perspective in this life? Well, it's not by never getting angry, but being slow to anger. Now, this can also mean that you get angry with people in your life who are hindering the progress of God. Okay? Um, at some point, I want to preach a sermon on what holy anger looks like because we have the word anger very skewed, very wrong. But holy anger is not fly off the handle. The holy anger is a very righteous anger that's rooted in wisdom. It's rooted in, 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 in very profound words that come that bring healing and, um, and protects the weak. Okay, what happens when you don't care about anything? When you don't get angry about anything in your life, what happens? Well, here's a picture, verse 19, the very next verse. verse. The way of a sluggard is like a hedge of thorns, but the path of the upright is a level highway. What happens when you don't care? What happens when you have no fire in you? What happens when you have no passion for God in your life? The Bible calls you a sluggard. What's a sluggard? Well, it's a slothful person, a lazy person. He himself is an obstacle to the purpose and the power of God in his life. How many of you have been there in your life where you yourself become an obstacle to God's blessing in your life? You hear, you know, God has a calling. God wants to bless you. And you're like, yeah, but not today. I mean, some of you, you're watching me from home because that's you, sluggard. You didn't get your butt to church. You're like, yeah, not today. The BSU game went long, so I'm hanging out at home. Well, next Sunday, I better see you at church because you are a hedge of thorns for yourself. Now, I mean this. 
You want God to move so powerfully in your life and you don't even want to give two hours of your week to grow in intimacy with Jesus? Come on, church. Cannot be this way, man. I know America is a breast, blessed, breast, blessed nation. <laughs> I'm hungry for chicken. Don't get me wrong. I know this is a very blessed nation. But we cannot... We cannot just hold on to worldly perspectives and be like, yeah, God will be there next Sunday too. Well, you might not. How do we shape a perspective? Perspective is shaped when you're hardworking enough to fulfill your purpose. I mean this, I mean this, I mean this. You want to have victory? Well, Jesus has done all the work, but you got to receive it. I mean, it'll work if you work for it. He's already done all the work. But hey, you got to be hardworking too. You got to get on it. You got to carry the cross. And um, I'll talk more about this in our third point. But you see, there's a parable that Jesus shared about talents. Three servants were given three different amounts. And the master went off on a long journey. And when he came back, the first two servants, they did something with what was given. They worked hard. The third guy buried it and went to sleep. He put it in the ground. And look at what the master calls him in Jesus' parable. Matthew 25 verse 26 says, But his master answered him, this is the servant who buried everything. He says, You wicked and slothful servant. That's another word for the sluggard. You wicked and slothful servant. You knew that I reap where I have not sown and gather where I scattered seed. And then he continues to say, You should have at least put the, the money in the bank while I've gotten my interest. Folks, what are you doing with your life? Are you so bogged down by the definition of the world's perspective? By what the world says you should be? By what the world's standards? Or are you fixing your gaze on the Word of God and claiming the victory, claiming the authority that God has given you? Are you walking in the power of the Holy Spirit? Are you walking in freedom? Knowing that even if you're old and poor or broke or weak, God's still given you life. And if he's given you life, he wants you to keep walking in his perspective because the mystery of perspective is the more you fix your eyes on him, the more you become like him and you begin to live the life that he's created for you to live. Look at what it says in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. It says, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works which God has prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. I want you to know that you're created for a purpose. You're created for a purpose. You're not here by accident. According to your parents, you might be an accident, but not according to God. <laughs> okay, fine. Surprise. Just the spelling is different. That's it. Still makes me feel really unwanted. <laughs> you're a surprise. It's still unwanted. Okay, fine. You didn't want me. That's fine. It's okay. It's all right. God knew. God knew. When God created man, he created man with a purpose. He says, okay, tend the garden, take care of creation. You have a purpose, but you will never find your purpose if you're walking in the definition of the world's perspectives. All right, moving on. We see that, how is perspective shaped? Well, be hardworking to fulfill your purpose. Verse 20, a wise son makes a glad father, but a foolish man despises his mother. Folly is a joy to him who lacks sense, but a man of understanding walks straight ahead. Okay, this is number three. How is perspective shaped? Be humble enough to learn. Perspective is shaped when you're loving enough to be angry. It's shaped when you're hardworking enough to fulfill your life's purpose. You're chasing after it. You're pressing into it. You're not waiting for man to tell you. You're listening to God, his perspective. And then when you're humble enough to keep learning. Why is that? How do we get that from this verse? It says, a wise son makes a glad father. Dads, isn't it nice when your son says something wise for a change? You're like, wow, not bad. I mean, come on, dads, you know what I'm talking about. You take personal pride and joy in like, my son, right? He's not an idiot, <laughs> you know? Like his brother, that, that's my boy. And then you're like... You turn to your wife and you say, that's your side of the family. This is my side of the family. <laughs> All right? But 
a wise son makes <laughs> one person says, yeah. <laughs> a wise son makes a glad father. Why? Because your son has been humble enough to learn from you. But a foolish man despises his mother. I oftentimes use this on my children. I was like, hey, listen to your mom. I know that you don't like what she's saying, but listen to her. There's wisdom in what she's saying. And it says, foolishness is a joy to him who lacks sense. Yes, I've seen too many people like this. It's a joy for them. And sometimes I'm envious of these guys. You know, I'm like, man, how are you able to live that way? But God's like, no, no, don't envy the fools. But a man of understanding walks straight ahead. He's not tripped up by anything. You see, when you're not humble enough to learn. Now I told you, how is perspective shaped? Angry over things that is an obstacle. Okay, you got that. I told you, be hardworking. Now some people, they have the anger and they have the hard work, but they lack the humility. And what happens? Perspective, gone. Their perspective is their pride because they lack humility. No, no, I'm talking to somebody. I know this. Your whole family leadership will change if you begin to apply all three together, not just one in isolation. This is not a la carte menu where you pick what you want. You got to be angry over every obstacle. And you got to be hardworking towards your purpose in life. But if you lack humility, you'll become self-righteous. And if you lack humility, you'll begin to shove your personal convictions on others as God's commands. Stop. I felt some toes under my feet just now. Sorry, but you need to hear this. If you lack humility, you will shove your personal agendas on others. And you'll hop, skip from church to church, from ministry to ministry. Those are the people who want the stage but they don't want to climb the steps, okay? You want the stage, but you don't want to walk in humility. You don't want to do the time. Yesterday, my sons came up to me and they said, well, one of them came up to me and said, hey, uh, dad, I'd like to learn to play the guitar. And he's been asking me for a while. I said, all right, I'll, I'll teach you. And uh, so we sat and I was teaching him, first of all, all the parts of the guitar. And I want to see if he's going to be patient enough to, to learn the parts of the guitar and then to learn this name of the strings and then slowly to teach him the basic scales. And I was actually pretty surprised that he picked up quite fast. And then uh, I was blown away that he actually wanted to sit almost all day yesterday. And I says, can I, can I just keep playing the guitar? I said, yeah, go for it. And I was like, man, not, not bad, not bad. And, and, and I, I was like, you know, a wise son makes his father proud. Good job. You know, because there are too many people who want to be overnight rock stars. You know how I know that? Because I was that. I was that when I was young. Went to my brother, I said, okay, teach me three love songs that will impress the girls. <laughs> Knew nothing about the guitar. So show me how to hold the chords, wrote on the lyrics, wrote chords on top, and that was it, man. I was in every school and college playing love songs. It was beautiful. But I wanted the stage, but I didn't want to climb the steps. And uh, that was a problem because when I became a Christian, God had to walk me through shifting my perspective, confronting areas where I was not humble enough to learn, to do the time and the presence of God, to come to a place of understanding. Sure, be angry over sin in your life. Awesome. Be hardworking towards your purpose, but don't forget humility that shapes you. Look at the boy who listens to his father's instructions, who's willing to go through the stages of growth. Verse 22 in verse chapter 15 says, without counsel plans fail, but with many advisors they succeed. Three verses come together like a little story, okay? First it starts off with a boy who's listening to his father's advice, then he grows up and he has friends who become his counselors. You see, some of you, you're older now, you don't keep calling your dad about who to date and when to get married. You have friends now that you talk to which is great, which is good. If you listen to your dad's advice, you will have wise friends. You won't have foolish friends who land you in prison. And then verse 23 says, to make an apt answer is a joy to a man and a word in season how good it is. And in the end, the little boy has grown up who has great friends who are good godly counsel and he's also growing in personal growth. Now, it doesn't explicitly say that this boy is reading the Bible and getting wisdom from, but the more I've been chewing on this, God's word is the standard for wisdom. 
whether it be business, whether it be emotional advice or life counsel, God's word is a standard for wisdom. So the picture of this is a boy who grows listening to his dad, overcoming sin. He has godly friends who helps him make wise counsel. They don't set stumbling blocks before him. And this man has got wise answers to give when the time comes. You know who this reminds me of? Jesus. Jesus was born into the world fully God and fully man. And the Bible says that Jesus had to grow up. Now, some people speculate that Jesus, you know, walked on water when he was a baby. I mean, I've had many questions. Did Jesus need a diaper changed or not? Uh, one day I will ask him when I see him in heaven. I don't mean to be disrespectful, but I really wonder, you know, it's like, man, what was that like? And there's a song by Michael Card that's very beautiful that kind of really started to pique my curiosity about Jesus. You know, did he cry when he fell down and played? You know, did he, like, when they're playing games, he's like, no, you really are out, but because I know I'm divine. And all that wasn't there, you really, was, it, was he really the empire who called all the shots? You know, the faithful empire? I don't know, but, but it says in the book of Luke chapter 2, verse 52, and Jesus increased in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. Jesus being fully man had to grow from being a baby to a boy to a man, and he grew intellectually and physically. Now his perspective didn't have to shift, but it began to expand. And what we see over here, if you want your perspective to be shaped, we have to become more like Jesus. Like I said, Jesus got angry at everything that hindered the purpose of God. Jesus grew in wisdom and in favor and in stature, and he grew in wisdom uh, of God and the wisdom of man. He's sitting in the temple and he's talking to the Pharisees over there, and he was humble to learn, and he was hardworking towards his purpose, even to the point of death on the cross. Okay, moving on quickly. Proverbs 15, verse 24, the path of life leads upwards for the prudent that he may turn away from Sheol beneath. Uh, a beautiful picture of what happens when your perspective is changed. Now, some of you, you are unbelievers. You don't know Jesus. You're not a Christian. And what's happening in your life is you're walking in a very worldly perspective that's going to lead you to the grave. It's going to lead you one day we will all die, but you will stay in the grave and you will not be raised to eternal life. And when you are raised, you'll be raised to, the Bible says, eternal judgment, away from the presence of life and love. That's because you choose to live in the perspective of the world. You're living for things that perish, for things that die. And the Bible is telling me that the path of life leads upwards. In other words, to use our language today, those who have a divine perspective, you're not living for things that die. You're living for things that are eternal. Church, I hope you're there where you're living for things that's eternal and not the person who's walking towards Sheol, the place of the dead beneath. So what should you do if you are an unbeliever over here? What should you do if you recognize that your perspective is leading you to the grave? Well, repent. Repenting is to turn around and to say, God, I want to walk in the ways that you want me to walk. Today, choose to be angry about sin that is distracting you from loving Jesus. The Apostle Paul was one who was extremely, extremely religious, and he was persecuting Christians. He was killing Christians all over the place. And he was on his way to kill a bunch of Christians and he saw a bright light and he was knocked off his donkey. I think it was a donkey. Yeah. But I like saying he was knocked off his ass. But, you know, <laughs> and, and he falls to the ground and he's blinded. But he gets up and is, he has a major perspective shift when he says, who are you, Lord? And Jesus responds and says, I'm Jesus that you're persecuting. Now the Apostle Paul had a choice. He could get back up in his blindness and walk. And when he got his sight back to go back to killing Christians, but his perspective was changed. At one point he was angry towards the church, but now he's angry about everything that hindered the progress of God in his life, the purpose of God in his life. And he starts becoming more and more like who God called him to be. And I'm here to tell you this morning that God can do the same thing to you. And I believe that some of you, you are falling off your donkey this morning. God is completely shifting your focus and saying, hey, wait a minute, man. I'm terrified about the life that I'm living. I'm terrified on the purpose that I'm going on and I need a change. I'm so glad you're here this morning because God, wants to change your perspective. 
The apostle Paul, in the end of his life, this is what he writes. He says in Philippians chapter 3, verse 14, I press on towards the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. I press on towards the goal. That's hard work. That's not giving up. That's getting angry at everything that hinders the progress of God in your life. And I mean this, every single thing that stops you from loving Jesus, every single thing that stops you from being committed to Him, you have got to put to death and press in towards the eternal prize of God in Christ Jesus. The mystery of perspective is this. It somehow begins to show in your life when you get angry, man, towards the things that stop you from being who Jesus calls you to be. Don't give in to laziness. Keep working hard. Some of you older Christians, don't stop now. Don't stop now. We sang, because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Some of us were so excited to die and see Jesus. I'm with you. Sometimes I don't want to look on either sides when I cross the road. I'm like, Jesus, it'd be better to be with you. But while we're here on this earth, man, God has a purpose for your life. There's still potential for your life. So work hard at living out the purpose of God. And then, while you're doing that, be humble. Number three, and we'll bring this to a close very fast. You're breathing? I'm kind of getting out of breath over here, man. <laughs> Number three, the potential that perspective unlocks. The potential. Now, this, I believe, is where it all begins to come together. You know, there's so much potential buried in you. Every single one of you. And I've heard people talk about potential, and I'm not here to boost your ego or just to give you empty encouragement. But I'm here to confront the lies that you have believed and you've buried your potential like the slothful servant who buried his talents. What if Job ended up cursing God? What if the Apostle Paul got up and continued to perse persecute Christians? What if the Apostle Peter never came back to Jesus? What if the perspective became the priority and it was taken over by pride. And because of that, they walked away from humility. What if they went down that road? And what if you are down that road this morning? What if you are the Judas who's walked away now and you're driven to a point where you say, that's it, there's no more chance. I, the only thing left is for me to die now, just to go kill myself. Uh, what? What if you're on that road and I want to talk to you this morning? What if that's you this morning, man? I want you to know that it's not too late. It's not too late. I want you to know that potential that God has created, Satan cannot steal. Listen to me. The blessing that God has for you, no man can take and no man can curse. But you can forfeit it by you walking your own way. You can forfeit it by you walking down, getting a noose, and hanging yourself, like Judas did. The potential that perspective unlocks is so powerful and beautiful. It brings repentance. It brings the calling of God back. In fact, it multiplies the grace of God because the Word of God says, where sin abounds, grace abounds even more. And I hope you're willing to make that journey back this morning, no matter how far you've gone. I wonder what you're forfeiting because of a wrong perspective. A few things we're going to look at. Once again, it's very widespread, but I'm going to do my best to tie it all together. Pick it up from verse 25. The Lord tears down the house of the proud, but maintains the widow's boundaries. Why is this so important? Because a widow is a person, it's a picture of someone who's absolutely helpless. Reminds me of uh, Naomi in the Bible, in the book of Ruth. Naomi goes to uh, Moab with her husband, Elimelech, and her two sons. They go to Moab because there's a famine in Bethlehem. And in Moab, she loses her husband and she loses her two sons. And all she's left with now is a widowed daughter-in-law named Ruth. And they make their way back to Bethlehem. And she comes back to Bethlehem and she tells the people, do not call me Naomi, which means sweetness. Instead, she says, call me Mara, which means bitter. 
Why? Because she's a widow and it seems like God has forgotten her. It seems like God has turned his back on her. It seems like she's lost everything. The word of God tells me in the book of Proverbs that God maintains the widow's boundaries. Now, you might not be a widow over here, but you might feel as helpless as Naomi did. And maybe you don't say, don't call me Mara, but you say, don't, don't, don't call me blessed. Don't call me anointed. Don't call me in the righteousness of Jesus. Don't call me a Christian when I'm just too dirty. Don't call me faithful. I'm unfaithful. Don't call me loyal. I don't know what you name yourself. I do not know what identity you're pressing on yourself because of your perspective that's been tainted by the natural and not by the divine. Listen to me very carefully, please, I beg you. The more and more you look to Jesus, the more and more you start to understand him and you imitate him. The more you press your eyes on the temporary, that becomes your identity. Oh, if only Naomi knew that God is a protector of the widow's boundaries. But you know what? It's only four or five chapters in the book of Ruth. Towards the end, you see her perspective is completely changed because Ruth, her widow daughter-in-law, her perspective changes. Where you go, I go. Your God will be my God. Where you die, I die. Completely radical perspective shift. And she gets angry at the things that get in her way and she does some crazy things. Now, she's not like fuming, angry, mad, but she pushes the boundaries, man. She's hardworking. She's humble. Her perspective is completely shifted. And in the end, in Ruth chapter 4, verse 14, it says, Then the woman said to Naomi, Blessed be the Lord who has not left you this day without a Redeemer, and may his name be renowned in Israel. You know why they're saying that? Because Naomi, who thought that her lineage was dead, her house was gone. Her name was gone. She instead has a genealogy now through Ruth. Ruth marries a guy named Boaz, and they have a baby named Obed. Obed grows up, has a baby named Jesse. Jesse grows up and has a kid named David, and he is King David. Now David has a bunch of kids, a bunch of generations, and from that lineage comes Jesus. You talk about a God who protects the boundaries of the widows. I don't care what your excuse is this morning, man. I really don't care. I will laugh at it. I'll laugh at it to a point where you begin to laugh at it too. I really don't care. I grew up without a dad. I'm uneducated. Uh, so is me. I'm not even from here. So is me. I'm broke. So is me. What else you got? Bring it. Come on. Let's go. Let's laugh at it till it comes under the subjection of truth. So our perspective is shaped by the divine, knowing that God protects those who are humble, those who are broken, those who have nothing. Because there's potential in you. There's a whole genealogy in you. And I'm not talking about physical genealogy. I'm talking about generations worth of blessings in you. And I'm not going to let Satan steal it this morning. Verse 26, Proverbs chapter 15. The thoughts of the wicked are an abomination to the Lord, but gracious words are pure. What's he talking about? Verse 27 explains it. Whoever is greedy for unjust gain troubles his own household, but he who hates bribes will live. Look at this. Look at this. Two, two verses side by side. Left hook, right hook, man. The thoughts of the wicked are an abomination to the Lord. It's put aside with this other verse in 27. Who is greedy for unjust gain troubles his own household but he who hates bribes will live. A person who takes bribes is a person who's not trusting the sovereignty of God. This week, if this message is speaking to you, I want you to write this down in your notes. God is sovereign. God is sovereign. That means he knows what's happening. He's all powerful over every situation. He's more powerful than everything that you're frightened of. You don't need to go whatever the bribe is in your life. You don't have to kiss up to anybody. You don't have to impress people. You don't have to live up to other people's expectations. All you got to live under is the care and the anointing and the power of God. That's it. God is sovereign. I'm so glad that I come from a country where without bribes, nothing happens. And I know exactly what this is talking about. And when I had to get my license or my passport or my visa to come to America, I had to bribe people. Otherwise, it wouldn't happen. And I'm so happy to tell you today that I got all those three things without offering a bribe. And I went to my home church and I told them to pray for me because I was going for a U.S. visa. 
And there's one lady who told me, don't even bother. You're young. You have no house in India. You're single. They're never going to give you a visa. Because just so you know, it's extremely difficult to get into this country legally. I, my mom was there with me when I went for my visa interview. I walk in, I walk out with a 10-year visa. I was so tempted to take that visa and go smack it across this person's face and be like, do you know who my God is? Do you know who my God is? Do you know who my God is? My God changes mountains. He changes maps. My Savior, he can move mountains, man. That's what he's able to do. I don't need to trust man and some sleazy guy who paid his way to sit in an office. I have the king who rules the universe. Do you have that king? I hope you do because nothing gets in his way. Um, when I'm walking in that perspective, you better watch out. Because I'll get in your face if you get in between me and the perspective and the plans of God. That's why God warned the people of Israel in Exodus chapter 23, verse 8, and you shall take no bribe, for a bribe blinds the clear-sighted. You lose perspective of truth. I do not know what your bribe is in your life right now. What it is that you're trying to pull strings and, you know, try to be this kind, good person. Man, you know why you don't trust the power of God in your life? It's because we have too many crutches that we lean on, man. Because you're not trusting God. Too many crutches that you lean on. Proverbs 15, 28, the heart of the righteous ponders how to answer, but the mouth of the wicked pours out evil things. Okay, you, this is beautiful. You see, when I talk about perspective, you also have to start praying about purpose in life, right? We spoke about God has a purpose for you. Now, a person who has no purpose will surround themselves with people who have plans. This is like 15 sermons in one, I get it. People who don't have purpose in life, they surround themselves with people who have plans. That's why I hate it in ministry when people are like, what's the plan? What's the plan? What's the plan? What's the plan? I'm like, the plan is to fire you and leave me alone. <laughs> Rather, I would like to talk about purpose. Hey, this is what God wants us to do because this is what he intends to do in our church. Next week, I'm going to be talking about purpose and what God's calling us for this next year as a church. You see, when we planted this church, we started off with no money. We're going to be celebrating seven years of God's goodness in our church. His faithfulness, not Joel's, not Megan's, not my children, not George and Annie, but God's faithfulness. Not once have we had to raise funds and take a loan and do this and do that. God has been faithful. Not because of our plans, but because of the purpose of God. What does it have to do with this verse? The heart of the righteous ponders how to answer. You know what that means? When we started this church, I had so many people come and ask me, but how are you going to support yourself? How are you going to feed your family? You have a baby. How are you going to do that? And some people even came and told me that is not biblical. You need to take care of your family first. You need to get a job. You need to do this. And I went for an interview and I got a job. And you know what? I felt like a prostitute. I'm not even joking. Till today, I find it hard to wear that shirt that I wore for that interview because I got a job. I came back and I couldn't get out of my car in the driveway because God said, are you really going to go sell yourself to the world? Didn't I call you to serve me? Aren't you going to trust me? Or are you going to trust your paycheck? And I was so irritated with the American version of Christianity. So nagged with the church. So frustrated at how Christians think. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You got to have, build a church, but you also got to have your plans. Man, to hell with your plans, man. God has a purpose for my life. I'm going to press in. Amen. But, but what, if, what, if, what if God doesn't come through? Oh, every single week I get asked this. What if God doesn't come through? What if God doesn't come through? You know what? You ready for this? God will always come through. You know why? You know why? Because my perspective is not on man and his plans. My perspective is on the divine order of God. And your plans will come through as God directs you because he will put his desires in your heart. His desires, not your desires, his desires in your heart. And you begin to walk in faith and you watch mountains crumble before you. Whether God says quit your job and travel half across the globe, which he wanted, did for me, and people say the doors will always be closed for you, God did it. Don't go do that, you will fail, God did it. 
I was threatened by some people. Don't plant a church, you will surely fail. God did it. And I'm standing here right here telling you that the righteous ponders how to answer. You know why? Because whatever we do will be in such contrast between what other people do. And so you've got to be ready to give an answer for the hope that you have. Yeah. Yeah. I remember meeting pastors who came to the valley to plant a church and they came with three years of their paycheck already paid by the sending church. They came with a hundred people and eight staff members. And it made me jealous in that time because here my wife and I are holding hands and praying for our next meal. Do you remember that day when you came and told me we're all out of rice? She said, we're all out of rice. I'm like, this is like Mary going to Jesus and being like, we're all out of wine. I'm like, bring me some sand. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I do children's parties too. <laughs> <clears throat> Children anyways eat dirt, so. <laughs> I'm kidding, I'm joking. But I remember praying. And I remember having to give an answer to people who looked down on me, who thought I was just completely derailing my family. Had people just thinking that I'm another flashy salesman. And I feel the pain for some of you. You're walking in the power and the purpose and the plan of God. Don't stop. Do not stop. Do not stop. Don't take your perspective off of what God has been walking you through and change it to man. Do not stop. You want to see the power of God in your life, man? Now, everything I'm telling you, if you think I'm boasting, yes, I am. Please let it be known. Yes, I, I'm boasting about how good my God is and how my God will come through for me. And I want you to get angry that you don't see the same power of God in your life. And I want you to get so mad that you start humbling yourself and learning more about who God is and pressing in, working, carrying the cross and saying, Lord, I want to walk with you. I want to live for you. I want to smell like you. And, and if this guy's able to burn for fire with you, I want to burn too. You see, verse 29, perspective that unlocks your potential. Verse 29, the Lord is far from the wicked. Here, 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 check, check out this potential. But he hears the prayer of the righteous. I, today, when you go back home, I want you to be in such awe. No, I mean this. I'm not joking, man. I want you to be in such awe. Like, like blown away, mad, like brain cannot handle it, that the creator of heaven and earth listens to you. You talk about potential that perspective unlocks. <laughs> you pray for breakthrough knowing that God listens to you? This is him that says, what a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege it is for us to carry everything, everything to Him in prayer. Now, the reason why our prayer is unpowerful is because you've forgotten the potential that perspective begins to unlock. Oh, Lord, thank you that you hear my prayer. Some of you, you're sitting in a dark room because your prayers just keep falling to the ground. <laughs> it's time for a perspective shift, for you to come out of your self-loathing, your victim mentality, and come into the celebration of what Jesus has for you as you give your life to him. Verse 30, the light of the eyes rejoices the heart. The light of the eyes rejoices the heart and good news refreshes the bones. You know, intelligence doesn't make a person successful. Intelligence doesn't make a person joyful. Intelligence doesn't make a person live their whole life happy, joyful, having everything they want. Intelligence doesn't make family sit around the Thanksgiving table It's only the light that comes from God. It's only the light that actually can lead you in the path that God has for you, the path of success. And it's so beautiful that Jesus says in John chapter 8, verse 12, I am 
the light of the world. The light of the eyes rejoices the heart. Folks, your potential will not be realized until you have come to Jesus, renouncing everything else. And then continuing on with him and in humility, learning from him. Verse 31 says, the ear that listens to life-giving reproof will dwell among the wise. That is God saying, I will keep teaching you, but you need to listen. As we bring this to a close, I really want you to see the enormity of this, okay? I really want you to see this. You see, when God created man, he put his light in them. He breathed life into them. In him was life, and this life was the light of man. When God created man, they had the light of God. And then what happened was, Satan whispered into their ears, and they lost the light. And ever since, we've been trying to create a false light. Ever since. You, and it proves itself that we're trying to create this false light by how we hate ourselves. We don't like ourselves. I'm too fat. I'm too thin. I'm too ugly. I wish I could be more like that. I don't like the way my hair is. I don't like the way my accent is. I don't like the way I walk. Oh my gosh, don't take any pictures of me. I just don't like the way I look in pictures. And we create a false light to live under. And that tells me that Satan is still whispering in your ears. But Jesus says that he is the light of the world. You see, these truths aren't just spiritual truths to be kept on Sunday mornings. These are truths that's brought into the reality of your Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. As you walk through this life, man, there are so many things that shape your perspective. But Jesus says he'll put his light that begins to shine into every dark crevice of your life that will bring you divine perspective, that will teach you to get angry over things that cause you to stumble, that will give you the energy to be hardworking, and then follow in his humble ways and keep learning. Verse 32 says, whoever ignores instruction despises himself. The word over there is he kills himself. Um, I'm not saying that everyone who despises, us, who ignores his teaching will go kill themselves, but you know what? It's not far from it. How many of you wake up every single day and you feel like you wake up just to keep killing yourself? Life is not life. You're just dying. You're just dying and you just can't wait to die. Well, the Bible tells us how you can get out of that vicious cycle. Don't ignore what God is telling you this morning. But he who listens to reproof gains intelligence. And then the last verse, the fear of the Lord, it ties everything up. The fear of the Lord is instruction in wisdom. And humility comes before honor. What a great way for us to close that chapter that sums everything that we've spoken in that last verse. The fear of the Lord, we said, that's walking in what God's given you. But for you to walk in what God's given you, you first got to see it. You got to have perspective. Perspective is mysterious because the more a person has influence into your life, the more you become like that person. So make sure that the mysterious person you're walking behind is the mystery of God's divine power and purpose for your life. Perspective unlocks potential because you were created with potential. Don't let anybody else steal that potential that God's given you. Keep walking with him. Let him keep speaking to you. Don't let anything that's happened in your life stop you. Let God's truth shape your perspective. And we see what potential begins to unlock. God will protect you no matter how far it's gone. God continues to protect you. He'll hear your prayer. He puts his light in you and he'll continue to teach you. If this message is speaking to certain areas in your life, before you leave these doors this morning, we're going to surrender those areas to Jesus. Some of you, you're going to be starting off on a new journey. Don't bring old habits into a new journey. Don't bring old habits into a new season. For us as a church, we're entering into a new year as a church. And I'm so glad that this is the last message we preach in the old year. Because as we enter into this new year, I say, Lord, my prayer is, Lord, change my perspective. I want to have a divine perspective. I want to see what you're seeing for me and for the church. And I want you to pray that prayer for your life and for your circle of oversight too, okay?
Would you please stand? We're going to pray and close. Volunteers, if you need to go get ready for our communion, you're dismissed. You can go do that. Father, I thank you for keeping a watch over each and every one of us, O oh Lord. Satan could have taken us down with the bad relationships we've been in. Satan could have taken us away from the potential and the purpose you have for us through the influences of friends, abuse, abuse of substance, abuse of people. Satan could have taken us down with what other people have done against us, said about us. But Lord, you've been so faithful, God. And I thank you, Lord, that no one is so far gone that you cannot redeem, that you cannot restore. And now, O oh Lord, for every single heart that needs to be made new, I pray, O oh Lord, that you would do it. <laughs> thank you, Lord, that you're able to do it and you will do it. I thank you, God, for new stories that are being born this morning, new identities that are being born this morning, a new journey that starts this morning. I praise you, Lord, for what you're doing. Lord, I celebrate now for the work of eternity that's happening in time right here in this church. I thank you for those who aren't even in this building that are rejoicing in the eternal purpose that you placed in us. God, begin to uncover it, Lord, more and more and more. We thank you as we go now to have our communion, as we remember your death and your resurrection. Continue to shape us, Lord, as we look to you, as we look to you, make us more like you. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 All right, we're not done. I know you're like, what? Still? Hey, I'm from India. This is the way we do church, all right? <laughs> Three services, 15 hours long. I'm kidding. Go out there, get some food, get some soup, talk to someone, bless someone, and we'll have communion together in just a little bit, all right? Very good.